Hello, good morning. Uh, welcome, everyone. So thank you for staying here after the keynote. Uh, we are way less people, but you know, the good ones are still here. Uh, my name is Daniel Medado. I'm a principal software engineer on Red Hat, and I'm also running the Fedora EPPFC group. Uh, so first of all, I know that this is a little bit of hype, so we just had AI, um, now Kubernetes, EPPF. Is there anybody here with, who already knows what EPPF is? OK, that's awesome. Uh, so let's, let's go ahead. For some of you, this may be a little bit, if you already know things, just let me know and I'll skip. But I just wanted to give you a quick overview about what EPPF is, how does it work, and what the hype is for. So EPPF, which, extend, uh, which uh, it comes from extended BPF, yeah, originally was developed to be somehow the backend of the next generation from uh, TCP dump. I guess everybody knows TCP dump. So uh, the thing is, basically this allows you to run a VM or sandbox within the kernel and to upload your code, so it's going to be much faster because it's going to be on kernel space rather than in user space. Uh, basically, like this is being used for networking, security, observability, and the different things. But I just wanted to quickly let you know how does it work? Uh, how do I create a BPF program? So um, and, and I know that there's a lot of bees over here, but if you oh, and I forgot that I got here. Uh, so you see here, let's go ahead and see what's going on. So let's say I'm a developer and I want to just create a BPF program. What do I do? So first of all, I need to code my super duper BPF code and run uh, a compiler such as LLVM. Uh, this is not LLM, so no AI harm here yet. Um, this gets compiled to, uh, into some intermediary bytecode. Um, this intermediary bytecode uh, gets Uploading later into the kernel using any kind of library. Just FYI, in BPF man, we are using this in Rust, but you can just use uh, C, uh, Go, or whatever works for you. And when it gets done into the kernel, it goes, goes through a verifier and just in time compiler. And then afterwards, uh, it attaches to what we call a hook. A hook is an, is an event on the system. So uh, why this has been used for networking so much? Because an event could be, I just attach a network interface. Uh, a network interface has gone down. Um, or for observability, some event happened. Um, so, so far we got our program attached to a hook. And that would basically uh, go ahead and call what we call a helper. A helper is a set of functions built into, into the kernel that do things. So. Uh, just think about Cilium, because I guess it's the most common, um, or at least the most known EBPF program that everybody's familiar with, it's a CNA plugin, but I'm not going to be speaking about CNA in this session. Uh, so let's assume that you want just to, I don't know, mirror a port over here. So you would hook up into, you would hook up into a hook, which is, okay, a network interface has been created, and you would create a call a helper function that would mirror your output to a different port. Uh, in order to do so, we are going to be using a map because uh, we spoke about kernel space, we, we spoke about user space, but uh, TLDR we need at some point to have some memory mapping in which this kernel space and this user space get communicated. So getting back here, if you see here, this is just a set of maps, which are those uh, data structures that you may want to use for EPPF. So summarizing. Um, I get my BPF program, it goes into a hook, uh, it does whatever use case you want to, and it may write into the map, which is a data structure in between the kernel space and the user space. Then in the user space, um, I may read from the, the map myself, and it deploys the user space program into the kernel space, and then we've got the map, which is the data storage. So far, this is pretty straightforward. It, gets, it would get compiled into machine code, somehow code, so it's going to be way more performance than whatever you do in user space, that's what people use it for, a lot of performance and, and so forth. But this comes also with some responsibilities. So how do I do that? Uh, I need to be root mainly in order to do anything from here. So this comes with quite a couple of, uh, well, so let's say security concerns. Uh, let's go to the next level. Uh, uh, let's assume, I, I assume most people here would know what a uh, kernel capability is. If not, we can speak later. But uh, let's assume we are using CAP BPF, which is a capability to run uh, BPF code. 
internally and within the kernel so far still kbpf maps to kaproot. So it's some kind of hack. So not really good. Uh, and also, what, happen, what do you think that may happen if I'm root and I want to run, I don't know, 200 programs that would attach to the same network interface? Not going to be good. So, I mean, there's some companies such as Meta uh, that just want to overwrite whatever is over there. So, about overwriting, which may think, uh, I mean, they think it's good. I don't think that's a good answer because uh, you may want to run several programs in parallel. And I'm not even speaking about a different kind of program because you can always run different kind of BPF programs such as traffic control or XCP or whatever in parallel, but not of the same ones. So as I said, uh, this is getting a little bit uh, high in demand. So you can see Cilium, which is a CNI. Uh, there's also some other CNIs also using BPF such as Calico. Uh, you, um, I mean, you, you guys know Pixie. This is also a monitoring tool which uses BPF. Uh, within Red Hat, which I work for, we got network observability or Kepler, which are tooling for uh, observability and power monitoring. But there's a lot. So how do you think that you could run all those all together? So this is a little bit, as I said, concern in terms of security. Because you can have two different BPF programs that may be running at the same time. Um, how do I ensure that is not doing odd things? You can't, you really can't. How, how do I ensure that, I um, don't oh, know, there's an, in eBPF, there's a new uh, standard being pushed, which is called BPF token, which, which makes things this so much more easy, but it's not there yet. So, so far, you can, let's say, download an image with um, a, a BPF program and be sure that this is a safe one, run it, and make sure that this is, not, uh, this is going to be totally okay. You can't. And not even with uh, Linux capabilities. Uh, so, no signing. Mm, and this comes with, uh, well, people are not happy with that. Corporations, uh, what, would, what do you think would happen if I got two programs running against the same network interface? They're going to just be colliding, uh, and it's going to be like some kind of operator. Uh, um, the worst thing that could happen. Uh, I mean, even if you can get some kind of something, as a, if you recall what I spoke about hooks, let's assume we got a hook that would work with parallelism. Um, I don't know. Uh, it's going to be having some weird issues that you're not going to be happy about. So we decide to go for it and sort this out. I know that all of you guys should be familiar with Podman, so we decided to do BPFman, which is not a superhero as some people thought. Sorry, it's not. But it does some quite good things. Uh, and also, one good thing is that, uh, I mean, no AI harm here, but we did do this logo with AI. You can complain about later. Um, so it's an open source project. You can collaborate with that, please do. So this is started in the Red Hat Emerging Technologies Group. And later on, it was. Uh, adopted by this Fedora CBPF group, which I'm somehow trying to run. So uh, if you have any questions about that, um, just by chance, I was speaking with some people over here who are really interested in packaging. Thank you for that, Victor. So we'll speak later. How, how does it work? This is super simple. There's two parts of that. The first part is just a CLI, just like a podman. You can do, hey, BPF man, go and run. Uh, don't load something that is going to be signed. Because we are using, we are used, uh, well, first of all, this is written in Rust because we wanted to. And we are using SIGSTOR uh, RS, which are the mappings from SIGSTOR. So we can just download an image from Quay, make sure that it's signed, it's something that we are happy with, and then run that in parallel and make sure that it has a priority. So you can have several BPF programs running at the same time with different parallelism and um, just run them in a much easier way than, I don't know, using XTP loader or whatever other tool. So we have uh, also a self-contained chain for Postal for Fedora 41, which would make this available on Fedora. So you can just go uh, install it, use it, please do, and you get feedback. So OK, so far we got eBPF. I spoke about security. I spoke about the, all how eBPF run has been run. And I also want to speak about integrations. So this session name is uh, orchestrating BPF programs, but so far no Kubernetes is harmed here. And I want to make sure that this works all together with Kubernetes. So uh, you can go here, and we also run an operator, which is called BPF Man Operator. And we just split that out from the main repo like a week ago. Anyway, if you go to our uh, GitHub repo, you can see that within, well, you can still use that within the, the GitHub repo from BPF Man. But we recommend you to go, to go to the other one, because it's where all the development is going to be is going. To be going. Uh, TLDR, this basically goes and uh, creates an operator that in the end you would have a privilege spot 
that privileged pod could, uh, would be able to go and run all the PPF programs within in every node. So uh, we got an agent, which is installed as a daemon set, and it goes on, but I'll explain a little bit further about the architecture. And as I said, uh, as late 2023, uh, we created a Fedora C group, which uh, we are on Matrix, and we are trying to pro basically promote uh, PPF man to be the default loader for PPF code in, into Fedora. Uh, because we think it's a super useful tool, and even though there's uh, another option, for instance, the other day we spoke about some guys that they were using a specific kind of PPF called, uh, which was only meant for um, human interface devices. I wasn't aware of that, so that totally doesn't match our schedule or our program, but anyway, there's another people. So the operator, uh, what do you need to do? work with that? Uh, of course, Kubernetes is something somehow modern. It doesn't need to be the latest one. And let's assume this also works with uh, OLM if you can install it, or you can just go and grab that in, in apply that directly. That will install too. So how do I deploy this? Just create a catalog source. I assume most of you guys are familiar with Kubernetes. If you are not, let me know. I can't stop anyway. You can uh, deploy that. Um, you can get BPF1 as a custom resource. This is a sample which is pretty much straightforward. That would be our uh, file containing the BPF program, and it would use this interface. And if we just run that, you'll see that it goes there. Okay, let's see how this works a little bit more in detail. Uh, before I get here, uh, yesterday I was speaking with some colleagues, and they were somehow scared about all that. Uh, don't be Pablo, because this is pretty much straightforward. So we call kubectl. Uh, what do we do? Let's assume with kubectl you deploy an, an eBPF program. So we got an agent, which is installed as a daemon set, and it communicates with, uh, within, uh, within every container. It communicates with the API server. And basically what it does do is, okay, I received a BPF program. So do whatever. It'll go, uh, and, I, I'm not, uh, and then, then later on, we are going to be writing something in the map. And on the user space, it's going to be reading things from the map and communicating the state to the API server. Uh, as this is super fast. I think it's going to be much better shown with the demo. But first of all, let's have a quick one about CRD types. So this is something that's going to be changing a lot in our latest release because people were somehow complaining that our CRs were too complex. So we got basically one per different kind of BPF program. Like uh, you got, uh, well, K-Pro, uh, Traffic Control, uh, U-Pro, XDP program. So we are trying to change our API to be more fam easy, easier and familiar for the end user. And another thing that we are going to be trying to change, and it's not here, so go with me, is that uh, you had to go and create a custom resource for every kind of program you wanted to. So what about if we really want to orchestrate? Let's say I want to run the Traffic Control PPF program, and I want to use, also run a K-Pro. What's the point in me having to run two different CRs? So we are basically making this all together and create a meta custom resource that would allow you to have uh, whatever you want with those ones. Demo. Uh, okay, let me see. I had some issues with Quay, so I didn't trust it and prepared a small one, so let's see if it works. Okay. Is the phone big enough? Bigger? How about now? May more be okay. Uh, awesome. Thank you guys. Okay, so first of all you can just run uh, we are also offering the user and the developer to run this on kind because we know that not everybody has access to a Kubernetes cluster, and this could be a, a little bit difficult to, to go with. So we are trying to make uh, as much as we can in terms of uh, availability. You can run that if you've got a Kubernetes cluster running, or, or not a shift, let's say. Uh, you can run this by, yeah, this by exporting kubeconfig. So this has been super fast. As you may just guess, this is just mocked, because kind took me yesterday like half an hour to run, and I, I don't have you guys here waiting for half an hour. I don't think it's fair for you. 
So, okay, let's see if we got a can. And we are going to be using one of those examples that we are having on the repo. I can guide you through later if you are after that. But for now, just trust me. This is a super easy example. So as you may guess, this is an XDP program. And we are just putting some metadata over here. And you can even select on which node this is being deployed. So you could just say, OK, I just want for my BPF program to be deployed on node 1, 2, 3, whatever, whatever level you want to. For now, um, I'm just going to be making this easy. And I'm going to be deploying this in, on every node. This is now being created. And over the hook, what would happen, and I'll go later back there so you can see the workflow, is that this is basically creating the BPF program. And what, what, um, what, does, what creates the BPF program basically is our agent, which is on every node. And this communicates uh, using an, an API, using gRPC. Uh, so the privilege spot would just go to the node and would create whatever uh, BPF program we are doing. This compiles that also under the hood for you. Now we can see uh, which XDP programs are we, uh, we have installed. Uh, as you can see, even reconciled because uh, within our code, and if anybody is interested, I'm really happy to give you a go. Maybe not in this session, but afterwards, uh, we got one, <coughs> sorry, we got one controller per BPF type. So that means that uh, we'll have a controller for XDP, we have a controller for traffic control, and we have a controller for like five or six of those. This is also going to be changing like a lot heavily in the next version because we have split uh, the whole um, controller part out of the scope from the repo. But let's see this a little bit more in detail. Okay, here, uh, well, yeah. Okay, I wanted to see this a little bit more smaller. I come with me. Uh, this works. So you can get the priority. You can see on which node it's been selected. You can see the status. And basically, you can see whatever you would do within the BPF operator, which I'll be showing you as a quick demo. I, this is, came from the FOSM, just only from the CLA part. But uh, I think it's good to know uh, once you have seen this part, which basically goes with, um, within the any operator part. You can also see that it's been loaded, a status type XDP, um, and it just works. What does the controller install? It's pretty much a standard. So uh, you have a daemon, you got an operator, we got a service, uh, and then we have like a replica set for the deployment. So as you can see, this is not really that much overhead for, yes, for what it offers. And we have been seeing that the consumption is pretty much low especially because uh, I want to mention that we follow operator SDK because not doing so may uh, deal up to you in deal with a lot of difference help with group API. Trust me, it has happened. So we are just decided to go with that. Yeah. And those are the types that we are installing when you install our operator. Um, now, I also wanted to quickly go for the demo here. Go with me because I, I'm not going to be able to make this bigger. So I hope that you can see this because this comes from our schema. But I just quickly wanted to, for you to see how this works with our operator. So this is just pretty much the same. So we got some random BPF code in C. This is our main file. So we are going to be building, in this case, a BPF man. It's not that fast, but yeah, you can mount. So I, I wish Quay would be this fast. Yeah, trust me. So we get this here. Okay, we're getting the images, blah, 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 blah. So now you can see that there's no VPF man, no, no VPF code running into a system. So we are going to be loading an image that you can just download it from Quay. So the controller does the same, but this is what it would do under the hood. You can see this, it will show you like the, the priority, the ID, the map ID that it's using again. And then you can see that it's, this is uh, using uh, the loopback interface to provide some contours. This is one of the minimal examples, but you can see that how does it work under the hood just for the CLI part. 
And this part is the one that we are going to be uh, bundling into Fedora. You can run another one, and you'll see that it has a different priority. Anyway, that's it. Also, I was speaking about the BPFC group, and just please uh, grab me a little bit for self promotion. So, we have, have established this in late 2023 and are aiming to go and gather all uh, BPF related force in Fedora, at least to provide some kind of metrics room and start to help. And we are, uh, one of the, our main goals is to successfully package BPF man without the operator part and put that into Fedora. That's been challenging. Uh, why? Because, uh, I don't know, is there any Rust developer here? Okay, I assumed. So Rust comes a little bit with challenges in terms of how do I package Rust. There's a super simple tool called Rust to RPM, which would just download your Rust code from, uh, from crazy.io. And if you have nothing to do, this is super simple. It would just go create the spec for you. So you could just go and basically get your RPM done in a couple of clicks. That's if everything goes well. But as with every language, uh, Go, Python, whatsoever, dependency hell. The dependency hell makes that uh, we try to make this to compile all the dependencies and, bund and bundle all the dependencies for BPF man. And we are also using a, a pure Rust BPF library called AIA. Just for AIA, we identified like 110 dependencies. And for BPF man, like let's say six store, also 120. As you can imagine, there's no way that a group, if you see here, we are like three guys, like the most active guys, do uh, you think we could handle 200 dependencies plus the dependencies they grabbed? Because this is, goes on, I said, dependency hell. It's a CM I just grabbed, went and grabbed a, yeah, say, okay, let's go package a, yeah, that's awesome. Uh, I packaged the first one and told me, hey, hold on, hold on. A, yeah, depends on whatever library, and for whatever library, you need to go, go on and go on and go on. So we decide for now to start with unbundle thing. That's pretty much like, a, I mean, I hope that, is, is there any Go developer here? Thank you, guys. So uh, basically, this goes, and it's like the same with Go and Vendor dependencies. So that would be like a little bit like if you do Go mode Vendor, you would bundle all your dependencies, but you would need to take care of that on your own and maintain uh, whenever you update those. It's pretty much like that. Uh, besides that, there's also one important thing that I just want to have a couple of minutes with, with your questions, which is licenses. So for most of the people, licenses doesn't really care that much. Uh, which do I use? Uh, I don't care. Uh, DPL, Apache, whatsoever. But when you are trying to put software into a Linux distribution, they do, they do a lot. Because that may make you unable, to, legally unable, to provide any packets if you don't do so. So I've been patching licenses for dependencies like 30 in this last month. And there are this more even interesting things, such as, for instance, for Fedora, uh, and specifically for uh, Sixtor and so forth, you may find that there are some weak cryptographic dependencies that you may need to get rid of. So this goes on. So TLDR, if you want to learn about that, um, want to learn at hand, please join over there, and I'll, I'll explain how, to, how do we work and how to work with us, and you'll learn a lot of rest, trust me. But getting back to... Uh, this questions. Go ahead. Uh, I'm gonna, yeah. How do you choose uh, what uh, the signature of images to trust and which image to trust? Uh, yeah, sure. So he asks, how do you choose uh, which images to trust? Because uh, what you do when you are loading things into BPF man, you are passing a Quay URL. So the Quay URL, uh, you can sign that, and you can unsign that with SIGSTOR. So what do we do with SIGSTOR is that uh, we can have, uh, it's like, it works with like, like a, basically like a hash. So you, you, we can read the, whatever we signed on, on, on Quay. We said, OK, this is OK. We trust that one. Now um, load that to the kernel. So it, pass, it passes some uh, checks before being loaded. Is there anything uh, like that with the public key or something like this? 
not yet. It, it, not exactly that. Uh, we are using. Uh, so he was asking about if this works with like public key, and not exactly that. This works a little bit different. But I can explain you later on a little bit about Sixtor and how this works because uh, he will have the time. Um, we, we plan to do use a BPF token, which is going to be let's say much more standard in terms of BPF. So that would maybe make me things way more simple. Go ahead. So you're saying that uh, how do we do with VPF man to uh, super ex so if I got it right to extend whatever we load with the uh, VPF man? So you want two containers in a board or something like that, where one is a VPF program, hmm? another potentially is my aggregation software where you can install Python or whatever. I don't really care about that part because what we do is we orchestrate VPF programs. Mm -hmm. So if you have anything unrelated to VPF or managed by BPF man, I don't really care. So, but we are in Kubernetes, so you can have another operator taking care of your program lifecycle, and that's going to be totally okay. So, what we don't support is, let's say, uh, to that our operator would go and take care of both BPF and non BPF programs. That's not supported because that's solely out of the scope. Any more questions? Oh, okay. okay. Yeah. Yeah. Is there any collection of BPF scripts to try this out? Yeah. So within the BP, if you go to GitHub BPF man BPF man, there's an examples folder where you can use. Uh, in, in fact, I grabbed examples that I did in the demo, and I'll be uploading the slides later on from that exact uh, directory. So you could try to uh, both deploy our uh, CRDs. Uh, deploy example CR and grab an example uh, VPF program to use for with the, both the CLI and the operator. Okay, if there's no more questions. Thank you guys. Thank you for attending. See you around.